exciting start. <laughs> can, uh, can you all hear me in the back? Derek, can you hear me? Perfect. So, first of all, thank you so much for having us here today and for being here to support us. Uh, it's been an amazing ride for us at Higher Learning Technologies as we built this company over the last seven years. And there's so many people in this room who've helped us to get to this point. And so it's really exciting to be able to share some of the things that we've learned across this entrepreneurial journey that we've been on. Because it's been a lot. And we have been through a lot of battles in building this organization. And so hopefully we can share some useful things that we've learned for entrepreneurs who are building a great company in the Midwest, whatever stage they're at. But, but also I think the lessons that we're gonna share are applicable <coughs> really to anybody. So they're, they're sort of life lessons, and that's a lot of what entrepreneurship is, is it, it applies in many places in life. So it, uh, it's really shaped who we are, and we're proud today to be able to share where we're at. But we're gonna start, I'm gonna face around a little bit. Uh, we are going to start by telling the story, giving you where we've been, where we're at, and where we're going for the first five, seven minutes here, and then we'll jump into the five biggest things we learned along this journey. So it all started, I'm in dental school, and I, I was very frustrated that I wasn't able to be, to use what I felt was modern technology <coughs> as I'm spending literally 30 credits that semester learning. And the way I consumed information everywhere else Right? The way that I was consuming anything else I, I was doing was through my smartphone and through you know, these games and these interactive elements. But when it came to dental school, right, there was black and white images in places and projectors and all these things that in 2012 just seemed like that shouldn't be there, right? Smartphones had already been around for four years. Everybody had a smartphone and everybody was using it constantly. You look at social media, there was all these different commenting functions and engagement and multimedia that was going on in the world. Everything was just text-based, this one-way communication. And so we felt like there could be something better that sat there. And our first instinct was actually not even to build it ourselves. Um, so I started reaching out to publishers, asking them, hey, will you please make this? I'm a dental student. I don't know anything about technology or starting a company. But they all told me it was a terrible idea, right? Nobody wants to learn on a phone. And that just made no sense to me. So I started dreaming up um, Dental Boards Mastery. And as you can see on the right, it wasn't maybe the most sophisticated at the beginning. <laughs> I actually, uh, so and you'll see throughout this, I actually went back through our old social media and just grabbed different elements because I almost forget how naive and badly <laughs> we did things in the early days. So everything you'll see in here is actual things that we made, you know, in 2012, 2013. Um, the age 12. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> so after, uh, after calling all these different publishers and having none of them be willing to do anything about it, we decided we were gonna have this nights and weekends project that we were gonna do. Um, so this is uh, Adam, Ben, and I, the three co-founders at HLT. And I found the first picture we ever put up on social media after we formed the company. So a little better than before, but uh, maybe not the most sophisticated still. Um, so, so the, the three of us, though, um, so we got together and we started working on this nights and weekends. Um, and we scraped together whatever money we could find, sold our, our belongings, and, uh, and started having somebody offshore do it because we had literally single digit thousands of dollars to build an app company. Um, how naive we were. But um, so Ben and I actually went to Africa and we saw that everyone there had smartphones. 
right? This is as we were working on getting this built up. And literally in places where they didn't have running water, they had smartphones. And because we believe in the power of teaching and giving people knowledge and of education, what we saw was that if we could use these smartphones and tie it in so we can have, we could really change the world. We could change people's lives. This is something that could be so powerful. If we could even make the training of healthcare professionals 10, 20 percent better, it would literally save hundreds of thousands of lives. And what more important thing can we do with our lives? Because you know, sort of selfishly, I call it selfish altruism. Um, we thought that by by really helping others, it would actually be the thing that make us the happiest more than just figuring out the best way to max out our, our paychecks in the short term. So, my mom's here, so I have to be careful. <laughs> uh, but, so then coming back from that trip, uh, we got together, the three of us, and decided that we were gonna leave our jobs, and I was gonna leave dental school in my seventh out of eight years. Wow. <laughs> She's over there, I'll put her out. Uh, let's say it didn't go over very well with the family. And really didn't go over very well with friends, with colleagues. You know, everybody looked at it as, what are you thinking? That makes absolutely no sense. You're going to leave dental school when you're almost done to make some app? But... We, we believed, as I said, this is something that could change the world. And, and we believed in ourselves. And so the three of us left what we were doing. And, and so this is at the end of 2012. And we were able to get our first product out, which you can see on the right. I have no idea why we have an other. <laughs> Maybe not the best UI design. But um, so and on the left there, you can see us. Right, that, that is us uh, huddled together on the screen it says who we are. And that's us discussing what we wanted to build and building the foundation of this. So by the start of 2013, we got this first product out. We started getting a couple thousand dollars a month that year. And so we, we were really excited with that. We, we thought that was amazing. Um, and then, in the spring of that year, we took the same concept and we brought it over to nursing. And so what it fundamentally was, was a way that they could study for their licensing exams by using their smartphone. We thought that would be a strong starting spot where we could build relationships and we could build a delivery vehicle in a place where we knew they had to purchase and in a place where we didn't have to go through the school because they would not buy from a group like that in a company at this stage. But we thought if we built the best product and we had a place where the students needed it and they were the ones to buy it, that we knew they wanted something on mobile. So after, uh, after we launched in nursing, you can see us slowly improving our presentation. Um, the team started growing. We, uh, we had actually, so when we launched that, it got into the top 150 grossing apps um, in the app store. So we started to see this big boom and pick up as we were helping nurses prepare for their licensing exams on smartphones. Um, so it, it was a really exciting time. I think you can tell looking at the picture that right, we, we were having so much fun as we went through this and felt like we, we always believed from the beginning that we were doing something that was gonna work. I, I don't think the thought ever crossed our mind that it wouldn't. And so th this was, an amazing time in in our lives, and I'm proud of you know the the smaller group we started with, and what we've been able to build up. So this is a more recent picture. Actually, we've even grown more than this. Ben, how many people are where we at now? I think we're pushing 50. <laughs> and we have. We've now launched over 100 different apps in the App Store. Um, we, have, we raised about $20 million now since we started. Um, and we, we've seen this really strong growth. And so in terms of where we're at now, it's something we're really proud of, 
right? And so you can see there's been a lot of ups and downs on that chart, but we have been able to grow, so, and we're, we're double where we were last year at this time, which is something we're, we're really proud of. We've had over, uh, so we crossed one billion practice questions answered, and we actually found out there's even more. We found out we weren't counting like half of the ones because when people reset their product, we weren't even counting that. So we don't know the exact number now. We're going back through it. We just found this out. But something like 1.5 billion practice questions answered by users, um, 250 million app launches, and 40 million hours spent inside of the product. It's essentially the equivalent of somebody um, going back to Roman times, um, using the app straight through day and night, every single second, um, all the way through now, and that still doesn't cover it. Did your mom forgive you? <laughs> You'll have to ask her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can you update that question again? Is that, how, how do your parents feel now? Did you forgive them? He's a rock star. <laughs> <laughs> Some days. <laughs> uh, so, so we've seen this great stuff. So that's a bit where we're at right now. And I could cover this story in hours long detail, but I'm trying to just give the quick version here. But so that's where we've been, where we're at. Now in terms of where we're going, because we, we feel like we're just getting started still. Um, so what we want to do now is we want to use the success that we've had in test prep. Because if you remember, at the beginning we said, we want, I was frustrated in general at the technology for teaching and not having the modern best practice and the way we're training these people that take care of our families and our lives. And, and so what we're doing is we're looking at extending beyond the test prep. So we're moving several years in either direction and with the continuing education, the professional development, and with some of the materials the students have. And because we have such a large user base, we have this delivery vehicle built um, we have the subject matter experts to be able to build it, and the community behind us. And there's a lot of great educational institutions around here that we have the, the privilege of working with. So we're, we're building all these different interactive case studies. We, we're calling them, it's basically like a flight simulator for healthcare professionals. Um, we're personalizing the product to our users. And what, what our vision is, is to be there from the time these healthcare professionals start school all the way through when they retire. And to be sort of the, the, what Netflix did to movies, right? To be the streaming solution that has all their educational needs as opposed to buying and hauling around these individual textbooks. It, it can learn who you are and follow you as you advance in your career. It just makes sense. It's been done in every other industry. It's time for it to happen in education and that's what we're gonna make happen. Okay, so on to the five lessons then. So that was the quick uh, HLP where we've been at, where we're at, and where we're going. But the first lesson that we're gonna go to is ask for advice, get money twice. So by a show of hands, I would be curious if anyone has ever gotten advice that changed the course of their life. Please raise your hand if you have. That looks like everybody. You know, by, it, and it's bigger than just asking for advice. It's that mindset of wanting to learn from the world around you. And I believe that's one of the things that's differentiated us from a lot of organizations was our ability to learn. We, we came in, um, Ben was getting his doctorate um, in healthcare as well. Um, so we both knew very little about business, but we knew how to learn. And part of the reason I had the confidence to leave dental school was I felt that if I read a book a week about business, if I got world-class mentors that I talked to at least once a week, and then if I worked at least 60 hours a week, and I did that over a five-year period, right? You do that over a year, you may get something, you may not. But if you do that over a long period of time, my opinion, it's almost like cheating. It's like you're guaranteed to win. If you read a book a week, you have world-class mentors who've already done the thing you're trying to do, and you do it 60 hours a week for a long period of time, then 
you will eventually figure it out. There may be really hard times and it may crash and burn, and but you can get through. So to me, it's like, well, I know it's gonna work. We'll figure it out eventually. Who knows how long it'll take, but so is it really that big of a, a risk? So tying into this mentality, um, so I, I had, as I said, I grabbed some old social media posts um, and some, uh, so, so this I think represents that mentality that we had, how aggressively we wanted to learn. So this is actually at the airport um, in O'Hare and we wanted to practice pitching. Right? I used to feel very uncomfortable with public speaking. I remember I froze up in dental school and I got nervous. So then what I did, I wanted to try to do 100 public speaking things in a year. And nobody wanted to hear me speak. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have anything. So at the airport, I basically walked out and said, hey, listen. We, right, my heart's racing. It's this terrifying moment. Everybody's like, what are you doing? I just want to sit in peace. But, so we practiced giving our pitch literally at the airport terminals. Because, and it, it's just that mindset to me about so aggressively wanting to learn that it has allowed us to outcompete many of our peers who started companies at the same time. It's not that we started ahead, it's not even that we had a better idea, in my opinion. And there's also a literal element to this asking for money, getting advice. Which, by the way, is a pit bull quote. We always joke about that. <laughs> but so, so we got uh, Dick Ferguson, the former CEO of ACT, to invest in us very early. Um, how could we do that when we have almost nothing? Well, we, we didn't go to all these different people who became, our, who became our investors and pitch them. We went to them and we asked for advice, right? We came to them with a learning mindset. And we weren't even trying to get money. It was something that that we want, we just genuinely wanted to learn. So, so I think, to me, this is one of the most important elements. So on to number two, looks like we got about 15 minutes here. You see the world through your own eyes. I think that this is something else that, that I see a lot of entrepreneurs doing, right? When you go to start a business, it's sort of like, hey, look, here's what everyone else is doing, so here's the way you do this. Here's the way you do that. Um, and the, the way we always approached it, perhaps because of our, um, I don't know what I call it, naivety in business, was just look at the situation. What do we think makes sense to do here? Okay, we need money. Like, so we didn't necessarily use all the playbooks that are out there. Um, we didn't go with the crowd when they said, you can't start an app. Like, you don't know anything about making apps. So we, we just looked and said, well, of course we can. People figure out how to make these. We can figure that out. Um, so, so we were able to use what, what I call first principle thinking. Um, and it sounds like an obvious thing to do, but it's something that I notice a lot of people don't. A lot of people go with what the group around them thinks or they don't really look at the foundational elements of something and come to their own <coughs> conclusions. They use this pre-existing knowledge. And that also means right, going to talk to your end consumers. And the, the one other piece I want to say on this that, that I think we did that led to us being able to build up this company is we, we sort of created our own little world. I almost put this one up here as perception is reality, right? You can see the world in a lot of different ways. If you look at this chart um, from earlier, there's all these jumps. If you isolate it, you just look there, it doesn't look like we're doing well. There's all these ups and downs and different problems. So if you allow yourself to sort of go with the hype, hey, we're the most incredible company in the world right now because we're going up. Oh, <laughs> things are terrible because we're going down, right? You sort of just gotta be in the moment and seeing the world through your own view and not get caught up in either the hype and praise or in everybody saying that's a dumb thing. So it, it almost sounds like it contradicts with the earlier one, right? Ask for advice, go to other people. But you have to do that so you can get the data and the inputs so then through your own head, you make your own decisions. You don't blow with the wind with every advisor that you get because what we found is People would have directly contradictory things they would suggest to us. 
people who seemed very smart, you know, one would say this, one would say that. It's like, wait, how's that? But they were, they're both right, right? Just in different situations and different ways and different methodologies. So, right, in terms of the creating your own world, right, it's like leaving the office so late. First of all, picking your own hours. That's me <laughs> seeing the world through my own eyes. Um, but, but also just enjoying those moments, right? Choosing to look at it as an amazing thing. Um, I, I thought this tweet that I made in 2014 was interesting because we, ma we made it feel like we burned our boats and there was no solution except to make this company work. Um, but, right, that sort of wasn't true. I could have gone back to that old school. There are these things, but we created our own world to sort of build the right conditions to allow us to do what, what we thought made sense. So this is another one, right? I thought I could be on Forbes 30 under 30 before we even had anything. That's a, a tweet from 2013, right? But then we were able to get there. So, so it's just sort of this creating our own world and seeing the world through our own eyes that look delusional to other people, but we trusted what we saw while at the same time being able to take inputs very aggressively from the outside world from books and from people. So with that, I'll pass it to Ben. So uh, how many people here are married? Show of hands. How many people have tried to change their spouse? <laughs> successfully. successfully. <laughs> So you can't change people, right? You can't change who we are. Um, it's up to the individual to change themselves. And so that's why we hire for the person and not for the skills. And in our belief, you can teach skills, you can train people to do the right thing if they're the right person. If they have an open mindset, if they're growth-minded, um, if they have drive, if they're, if they're willing to learn, and if they're a sponge and absorb information and knowledge. Um, obviously, it's not one or the other. You have to have a little bit of both. You have to have some skills, right? We don't hire people, freshmen in high school with, with no work experience. Um, but we really do focus on the people. And that's one of our key areas for building a great culture. Um, there's certainly exceptions. You know, if we need an iOS engineer, we have to go and hire somebody with some iOS engineering skills. I could not do that. I'd crash and burn. Um, no matter how hard I, I try to learn that skill. Um, but for the most part, um, culture for us is super important. You know, we spend eight hours a day, uh, 40 plus hours a week with these people around us. I mean, I spend more time with my coworkers than I do my significant other. Um, yet we spend more time finding the right person to marry, the right person to spend our lives with. When in reality, the people that we spend time with at work, we're almost more married to. And so we should spend the same amount of effort and time getting the right person um, that's sitting next to us every day, day after day. And so that's kind of our approach when it comes to hiring is get the right people on board, get the right people in the right seats on the bus, and the bus will go as far as it wants. I think it's worth worth noting there that we right we were able to get some really great people at the very beginning when we first started. And I think just as importantly, there were some great people that we worked with early that we ended up moving on from. Um, and, and I think being willing to really play right with that, right? Because that, that just creates the foundation that's gonna ripple through everyone, right? Very obvious once again, but those decisions are so difficult to make. But when we found the right person, we would do, I mean, we wouldn't accept no for an answer in circumstances where we should have had no shot to get them, given where we were, what we could pay, all these different things that looked like the deck was 100% stacked against us. So this is a good picture of uh, probably the first year or two of HLT. Um, the majority of people in this photo are probably around the age of 25. That's how old we were when we started HLT, and of course, what did we do? We hired our friends. Um, one pivotal moment in HLT that really brought us from uh, an early stage startup with a bunch of let's say adolescent boys, <laughs> to actually uh, developing a professional uh, company, uh, was hiring this person right here, Ron Meyer. Um, a lot of you may know who Ron Meyer is. He's a phenomenal person. Uh, but he came in as, we'll call him the, the dad of the group, <laughs> uh, after about a year and a half of starting HLT, or maybe close to two. 
and, and he's been phenomenal. He's been with us ever since as our chief operating officer, and he has, has had um, a lifetime of startup experience, growing companies from nothing to hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue, and he was a game changer for us. And this goes back to you know, hiring the right people at the right times for your senior company. This was an individual that came at the perfect time and has since helped grow the company and has been just a pivotal part of our success. So I forget about uh, Justin coming to you then. Um, Justin, do you remember this uh, fungin time? That, that's right. We, uh, we label ourselves the flat house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At the very beginning, yeah. we, we quickly had to change our image. But. <laughs> it took a little bit. You can actually see the sign there. It says, welcome to the fungin. And we, and we thought it was just amazing. This, it's terrible looking back at it, but we, we were just having the time of our lives doing this because of the, the people that were surrounded with us. Um, here's another picture of us later on. Uh, this is probably like, just a couple years ago, um, but just a good example of uh, working with people that you love to be with. Um, we say everybody has to pass the beer test to work at HLC. Um, they don't have to drink beer, but they have to be the type of person that you'd want to go out and have a beer with, because they're just cool people. And uh, I think this was at a Christmas party. I think we did a gift exchange for the for our holiday party that year. But um, yeah, we just really focus on hiring amazing people. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, you know, I think the difference between a sprint and a marathon. With a sprint, you don't really need anything. You just run. You run as fast as you can for a short period of time. But with a marathon, you need all sorts of supplies to keep you going, right? You need to have constant water breaks. You know, grab a, a glass of water as, as you run by the crowds. Uh, and a lot of people have those little energy views, for lack of a better word. Um, you know, triathletes use them, marathon runners use them. Um, it's the same way with the business. You know, early on, we were spending, I don't know, 15 plus hours a day, six, seven days a week, because we thought it was a sprint. And, and we worked our butts off. And you know what? That's that's doable for a, for a certain period of time. Um, but in the same life, in the same life, uh, that's nothing you can do for ten years straight or five years straight. Some people do, but it takes a toll, right? So uh, we realized over the years that it is a marathon, and we have to do things right, both to ourselves and taking care of ourselves, but also the way we take care of the business. We've we, we've made a lot of uh, uh, we've done a lot of things in the past that were very short-minded, very short-term minded, and short-term thinking. Here's a picture of one of our apps, uh, ranked number one in the top grossing educational app store. Um, this was a big moment for us. This was probably 2014-ish. Yeah, well, um, we have the May 2014. I grabbed the social media. Oh, right. um, we, were pretty, we were pretty excited. I mean, we beat out uh, companies like Luminosity and Udemy that are, that are huge companies right now, way bigger than us. So we were, we were thrilled. Um, but to get there, we did a lot of things that we wouldn't necessarily do for long-term thinking. We ran a lot of sales, discounts. You know, we really pumped a lot of advertisement. We were so focused on growth that we just spent all the time and money we could to get this number one spot. Now, since then, we've realized, okay, what can we do for long-term growth focus? You know, not, not discounting the product constantly to get more users in the front door. Um, not spending every extra dime we have on, on marketing. Uh, at a, at a long-term loss. And so over time, we, we've, we've uh, developed better, better strategies to focus on long-term growth. And so like I said, it's a, you know, it's a marathon, not a sprint. So make sure that you make long-term, good long-term decisions. And any short-term decisions you make, don't sacrifice the long-term goals. I skipped it. I skipped that one. That's right. The, yeah, and, and we, that is something that we've really changed with. It was about growth tomorrow, earlier on. Now now the thinking is, and actually the things we did well were about growth in, you know, in six months or in a year. Because some things that you do in the business take time to pay off. And those often seem to pay off the best in the long run. So th this is one of my favorite things to, to say. Entrepreneurship is a community sport. L look what we're all here doing today. Right? It's things like this that have, um, have supported us and have allowed us to make this company. It's the support of so many people. It's going to all these different events. Um, I was going to show this video, but I won't, given the, uh, the timing. But it's basically me saying entrepreneurship is a community sport. And all the people who've been involved 
all the people who've helped us at all these different stages that have been vital to us being here today. And so going out into the community, giving back some, um, and, and connecting with different people, it doesn't always feel like it adds something tomorrow, right? But you build up those relationships, you build up the trust, you help other people out, and that pays off in the longer run, right? So we started having the University of Iowa do all these different things to help us. And, and you know, they gave us, um, well, I shouldn't say gave, but we, we worked with them and they uh, basically through our partnership and they were able to um, give us the press box for a big event that we did in the company, right? Everything's so intermeshed together uh, with the, the actual entrepreneurs, all the people supporting the entrepreneurs, and really the rest of the community too, right? The schools are feeding the talent that's feeding in to us. The, the banks are helping provide capital to the organizations around that support us or to us ourselves, right? All these things play together, and so the whole community needs to be intertwined to really make entrepreneurship work. So this is actually me from One Million Cups in 2013. And so who knows what I said. Hopefully the presentation's a bit better <laughs> by now, um, or at least presentation skills. Uh, but so it's, it's events like this and things like um, all of you are attending and supporting and being engaged with today that have helped to build us. So I really look at higher learning technologies as something that's been built out of this community and out of people like the people in this room rather than something you know I built or Ben built. Um, it, it's something that in my mind we're all building together as a community and I think that's the only way entrepreneurship <laughs> works. So thank you to everyone for being here for supporting us and for supporting all the great entrepreneurs in this area. So we are uh, going to take a few minutes to allow them to answer two questions from the crowd. Um, so ask away. That's, that's a better one for you than me. Um, the shiny ball syndrome. So, you know, I think with anything in life, it's easy to get distracted and chase the shiny ball. Everyone wants the new, you know, everyone gets excited about the new, fun, cool idea. And even, you know, that's especially true early in the startup. You're kind of figuring out your path, figuring out, you know, what the product is going to actually be, what problem it's actually going to going to solve, and it's easy to get sidetracked. Um, you know, that's true with, with user acquisition, with, with building up the team, it's just, um, it's, it's a constant problem. I think early on in a company, it makes sense, right? You're still trying to figure things out, so every idea is, is fair game. Every idea should be pursued at least a little bit. Uh, but as you mature as a company and you find that product market fit, you really just, you have to stay focused on what you're best at. A lot of companies go too wide in terms of what they're offering um, and the, the value prop that they're offering. But in reality, what we've realized over time is you have to stay focused on what you're best at. And we've had, I don't know how many examples of, of going too wide, stretching ourselves too thin because we're chasing too many things. Um, want to give an example? Sure. We acquired a company and we got a uh, hundred apps from their portfolio and we went way wider and right, it's just too much. If you would, what we felt we had to do was really focus on the markets and the verticals we were best at. So, so we've narrowed our focus to really be locked in on healthcare and the lifelong learning within healthcare rather than GRE, GMAT, a bunch of these other things that we had done before. Great opportunities, great ideas, but not all as synergistic with each other as if we lock in on one area. So then we can have the subject matter experts, the content crossing over, the deep user understanding. So, is that a fair example? Yeah, good. Thanks, man. <laughs> so one more question. 
decision I ever made. <laughs> the trajectory that we're on, regardless of what happens with HLT, is, is wildly different than where we would have gone, and we're better people for it. 